Yo, what is going on, Fantasy Addicts? I'm your host, That Fantasy Addict, and today we are going to be looking over the third part of sophomore wide receivers heading into 2020. If you have not already seen part one and part two, definitely go check those out before you continue watching this video because I did order the players around in the assumption that you would be watching the first video, then the second video, then the third video. So it's not completely mandatory, but it will definitely help you understand this content better. Now, if you have already seen both of those videos, then this is the right video for you. So let's hop in to the first player up. So our first player is Marquise Hollywood Brown on the Baltimore Ravens. Hollywood Brown did not participate in the NFL Combine because he had surgery prior to the Combine, so it wouldn't have been healthy for him to participate. However, we know from watching his college film that if he were to participate, he would have had one of the fastest 40 times amongst wide receivers in his draft class. We can also see that last year he was ranked 102nd in snap share and 73rd in route participation. That's pretty good because he was able to produce a lot in those very limited snaps that he had. So for the rest of this season, as long as they use him more than they did last season, he should be putting up a lot more production. He was also 13th in red zone receptions and total touchdowns. This is good because he was definitely able to convert a lot of deeper balls into touchdowns, whether they were long passes or they were slants and he just took it to the house because of the speed, but they also used him in the red zone a pretty good amount. And we do like to see that mix so we know that he can have consistent touchdowns throughout the season. He was also 44th in drop rate, which is very relieving to know that we're not going to have to worry about drops this season. It's something that a lot of rookies struggle with, but he did not, so we don't need to worry about dropping balls this season. He was also 8th in fantasy points per route run, so he's one of those guys where even if he has a game with only 4 or 5 targets, he can put up a lot of fantasy points on those targets because of his speed. He is able to take any pass from his own 20-yard line all the way to the house for double-digit fantasy points. He was also 6th in quarterback rating when targeted. Even though Lamar Jackson was very good last year, he was even better when he was just targeting Hollywood Brown straight up. So there are a lot of things to like about Hollywood Brown. He definitely has a lot of potential, not only on the season as a whole, but with any given target. But there are a lot of things that I am pretty concerned about with him going into the season. First of all, he failed to see over 80% of offensive snaps in the regular season. In any single game, he failed to reach that mark. I know I said earlier that it was a good thing that he did not have a good route participation or snap share. And even though that may be true, it is a little concerning that he was consistently not getting a lot of routes. That's not something that we like to see. We didn't see any improvement as the season went on, like we saw with DK Metcalf, for example, who we recently covered. So the fact that he did not see 80% or more of offensive snaps in any game in the regular season, that is a little concerning. And by the way, he did see 80% of snaps in one single game, but he never saw over 80% of snaps. In addition to being inconsistent in terms of playing time, he was also inconsistent in terms of targets each game. He only averaged 4.6 targets per game in wins that the Ravens had last season. And that's very concerning because the Ravens are a good team and they are going to be playing a lot of easy teams this season. If they are winning a lot of games, which they should be, Marquise Brown isn't going to be getting a lot of targets. He also averaged nine targets per game in losses. So yes, that is technically good because when they lose the, when they lose the game, he is going to get a lot of targets but they're not going to be losing many games. So we hope that they're going to be losing games from a fantasy football point of view, but that's not really going to happen. So it's not good that his total targets on the season was heavily inflated by the few losses that they had. Hollywood Brown did not see a single red zone target in between week 13 to 17. This was largely due to Mark Andrews and Nick Boyle being solid red zone options. Not to mention... The offensive coordinator last year was Greg Roman. If you don't know who he is, he was the Ravens' tight end coach in 2017 and 2018. So obviously, he knows how to use tight ends, 
and he really likes them. He wants to get their tight ends involved in the offense. He's still the offensive coordinator this season, so tight ends should definitely play a very important role, especially when it comes to the red zone this season. It is a little concerning that the offensive coordinator really enjoys using tight ends and knows the tight ends on the Ravens very well. The Ravens also led the NFL in one wide receiver sets last season. Yes, Marquise Brown probably is the best wide receiver on this team, but the issue is he isn't the most well-rounded receiver that there is, right? He is a very fast player, but he's not necessarily a possession guy. If they need a possession guy and a bigger guy, they're not going to be using him. And with one wide receiver sets, they obviously only have one wide receiver in. So whenever they want a big guy in and are going into a one wide receiver set, it's not going to be Hollywood Brown in the game. The Ravens also subbed in players very often, and they sub their starters out pretty often, with the exception of their offensive line and Lamar Jackson, their quarterback, obviously, and their running backs. So even Mark Andrews, who was extremely good, he just he played just 41.36% of their offensive snaps. Even when someone is very, very good on that team, they like to sub them out, get them rest, and get the backup some playing time. So that is concerning because no matter how good Hollywood Brown is, clearly they're probably not going to put him in as many snaps as most other teams would. They also drafted J.K. Dobbins. So they clearly want to establish the run game even more than they already did. Mark Ingram was very good last season. He was easily one of the better running backs in the NFL. They could have just kept him and rolled with him. But they weren't even satisfied with just that. They also wanted to use a high pick on J.K. Dobbins because that is how important the run game is to that team. Obviously, especially in the red zone. And that is not something that we want to be seeing in a wide receiver on his team if we're going to draft him onto our fantasy football team. So with that being said, what is my view on him in fantasy football this season? So Marquise Brown is going as the wide receiver 30 and a mid 6 round pick per fantasydata.com. Every ADP that I'm going to give in this video and all the ADPs that I gave in my previous videos, part 1 and part 2, they are all per fantasydata.com. I will leave a link in the description below. So even though he definitely has a lot of potential, if he plays more snaps and if they use him more, he definitely could easily break out. The thing is, I'm just not quite sure if that's going to happen. If they don't play him a lot, there is ultimately no way that he is going to be a wide receiver one or really even a wide receiver two. Now, there's guys like Michael Gallup, Tyler Boyd, and Deontay Johnson. I'm fans of all of them, and they are all pretty much just as good and going one to two rounds later. Some of these guys don't have as much potential as Hollywood Brown, for example, Deontay Johnson. On a week-to-week -week basis, he doesn't have as much potential, but he has probably more potential to be a value for where he's being taken. Even though he's going to be more of a consistent player on a week-to-week -week basis, that, if anything, is better than being boom or bust, except for best ball, which I will get to in a second. So in redraft, if Hollywood Brown is the only good receiver left, I think he's okay but I don't want him in more than one or two leagues just because of the fact that, yes, he has potential, but I don't think that he is going to reach that potential. In best ball, I think he's a fine pick. I do think people are overdrafting him, but I think he's a little better pick in best ball, even though his ADP is higher than in regular season-long redraft, just regular where you start your players at the beginning of the week and they're locked in. In Dynasty, I do like him more in that format than any other format because I think he's very talented, and on the Ravens, it's not that great of a situation unless they play him a lot more and Lamar Jackson starts throwing the ball more. Yes, that could happen, but I think the situation's not great, and the situation will hopefully get better soon if Marquise Brown goes to a new team. And Marquise Brown is very talented, so in Dynasty, I do think he is a solid pick. Now, let's get into our next player, which is Darius Slayton of the New York Giants. 
Darius Slayton is very, very fast, right? At the combine, he ran a very good 4-3-9 40-yard dash. That put him in the 95th percentile. He's also in the 60th percentile for his agility score and the 95th percentile for his catch radius. His hand size is also in the 87th percentile, so all of these metrics are very good. Also, his yards per reception in college was in the 90th percentile, which is very promising. Daniel Jones also looks promising, and Daniel Jones is his quarterback, so I would say that he's pretty important, wouldn't you? Not to mention, Daniel Jones is not afraid to throw it downfield, and Darius Slayton definitely thrives in those situations. He is very fast, and he is capable of running a downfield route, oftentimes just a simple go route, and taking that for a touchdown. Daniel Jones is one of the better fits for Darius Slayton. Darius Slayton also ranked 8th in total touchdowns last season, despite being ranked 73rd in red zone receptions. He also had a 33.3% contested catch rate. That is not great, but it was ranked number 27th last season, which still isn't bad. And it is something that rookies struggle with. Contested catches are not easy in the NFL, and it's one of the biggest differences going from college to the NFL level. It is something that he can most certainly improve on this season, and given that he was in the top 30 last season, I do think that he will make massive strides in that category this season. Not to mention, Saquon Barkley will be there to distract opponents, so he won't always even have to be catching contested catches because Saquon Barkley is going to relieve a lot of the pressure. Not to mention, there is a variety of weapons in this offense, such as Golden Tate, Sterling Shepard, and Evan Ingram. They will all be forcing opponents to pay attention to them. Now, Darius Slayton might be the wide receiver one on this team. It really is between him and Sterling Shepard. So even though some guys are pretty good, none of them are that much better than Darius Slayton, except for Saquon Barkley, obviously. But none of the other guys are that much better than Darius Slayton. So the Giants aren't going to be using them a ton, but defenses will still have to pay attention to them because they are capable receivers. Now, I know in my very first video in the mock draft, I said that I would draft Sterling Shepard over Darius Slayton. However, I think that has changed. It does depend on my roster. If I want a safer player, I will go with Sterling Shepard. But generally speaking, I'm now swaying towards Darius Slayton. So he is my top receiver in this offense for fantasy football. Darius Slayton also ranked 21st in fantasy points per target. That's a pretty good number, especially as a rookie. While he's not someone like Tyree Kill or A.J. Brown, who is going to take a large percentage of their 5-yard targets into 50-yard receptions, he still is better than most in fantasy points per target. He doesn't need a ton of targets to produce. And that's something that Sterling Shepard, his teammate, definitely struggles with. His fantasy points per target was not as good. Darius Slayton also ranked 10th in production premium and 11th in target premium, meaning that he was a lot more efficient than his teammates and other wide receivers. So he was very good as a rookie, and more importantly, he was better than his teammates, at least the majority of them. So there is a reason for Daniel Jones to really want to target Darius Slayton this season. Something else that is very good for Darius Slayton's case is that he averaged 9.6 targets per game in losses during the second half of the season. So, as a rookie, it definitely takes a few weeks to really get used to the NFL level. So, when we look at the second half of the season for a rookie, that is a fair thing to do. For fifth-year receivers, looking at the first quarter of the season, or the last half of the season, or the last three weeks, sometimes while there are situations where that is completely fair, a lot of times it's not. But with rookies, you can do that because the first half of the season is really just getting adjusted to this NFL level. And when we look at losses, that's definitely something that the Giants will be doing a lot this season, especially considering that they play a lot of very good teams. Not to mention, many of those good teams also have bad defenses, so that just makes it better for fantasy football wide receivers on the Giants. So when we see that he averaged a good amount of targets, not just a good amount, a ton of targets on losses in the second half of the NFL season last year. 
it shows that there's a lot of potential for Darius Slayton to be top 15 or 20 in targets. Darius Slayton also is the biggest of the three starting wide receivers on the New York Giants. Golden Tate and Sterling Shepard are both 5'10". Darius Slayton is 6'1". He should be the primary red zone target amongst wide receivers in this offense. I do expect this offense to be about average, if not maybe even a little above average, maybe a little below average, but they'll be hovering around the average mark. And they'll be throwing a lot of passes for sure. So being the biggest of the three wide receivers, that means that he's going to be getting a good amount of red zone targets. At least he should be. Hopefully the Giants use him correctly and give him the targets in the red zone that he should be getting. Finally, Darius Slayton is just an all-around solid wide receiver. He's not great in any category, but he's pretty solid all around. He can play anywhere pretty much, and he can do most of anything. He's not fantastic at it, but he's capable of doing anything that the Giants want him to do. So there are a lot of things that I am very high on with Darius Slayton's game, but there still are some things that we need to be cautious of before we draft him. First, The Giants receivers have the 11th most difficult strength of schedule per pro football focus. I will leave a link to that website in the description below. Also, in the four wins that the Giants did have, he saw just five, two, three, and two targets in them. So yes, the Giants might not be a great team. I don't think that they will be that good at all. But if they happen to be a good team and put up seven, eight wins, or just an average team in that case... Those will be seven or eight games that he's probably getting less than five targets in most of them. That's not something that we want. He also ranked 97th in true catch rate. So he actually had decent target quality. As you can see, his target quality rating was 18th. Daniel Jones was giving him some solid targets. However, he was not very good with those targets because true catch rate, which says a lot more about who he is, as opposed to what his stats put up last year and inflated due to good quarterback play, it shows that he wasn't actually catching a ton of balls that he should have been catching. I know I said being a solid all-around receiver who doesn't necessarily excel in anything was a good thing, but in a way, it is sort of bad. He does not excel in yards after catch, which he ranked 55th in last season. He did not excel in target separation, which he ranked 99th in last season, or contested catch rate, which he ranked 27th in last season. But that contested catch rate number should go up a little bit, so he might be pretty good in that category. But nonetheless, he didn't absolutely excel in it or any of the other categories, so sometimes it might be hard for him to put up really, really good numbers just because there's not a single category or something that he can focus on to put up elite numbers. Finally, there is some uncertainty with how this team is going to do, mainly how the coaches are going to be. New head coach Joe Judge and offensive coordinator Jason Garrett might not use him the way that we want him to be used, or that he should be used, that will get him the most fantasy points. With all this being said, what do I think about Darius Slayton? So he's going as the wide receiver 40 and an early ninth round pick, Once again, per fantasydata.com, PPR, ADP. As an early ninth round pick, I think he's pretty good. I do. I think that it's a solid pick, and for a ninth rounder, you're getting someone who you think and you can be pretty sure that will put up some solid numbers. However, it's not just about having a good pick. It's about being a better pick than everyone else around him. And there are guys who are going just slightly before him, These guys are Michael Gallup, Tyler Boyd, Deontay Johnson, Marvin Jones, and even Julian Edelman. All of these guys I am bigger fans of. Depends on the situation that you have, of course. It depends on your roster construction. But generally, I am bigger fans of them than Darius Slitton. If they're all gone, go for Darius Slitton. Absolutely, I think he's great. But if any of those players are available, I do want you to take them over Darius Slitton unless you have a unique situation and a unique roster construction that justifies you taking Darius Slayton over some of those guys. So that's for regular redraft standard fantasy football. 
in best ball. I think he's also a solid pick. I think he's about just as good of a pick in best ball than in regular redraft fantasy football. Solid pick, but make sure that guys like Marvin Jones and Michael Gallup aren't already taken. In Dynasty, I also think he's solid. It's kind of the same way all around. Solid pick, just make sure that you're not reaching on him because in Dynasty, a lot of people reach on players who are younger. And even though, yes, it's good to draft players who are young, you don't want to reach for them much above their ADP. Our third and final receiver is Nikhil Harry on the New England Patriots. The new New England Patriots because Tom Brady is no longer there. We have Jarrett Stidham at the quarterback. Now to start off our Nikhil Harry analysis, he had very good workout metrics. He was in the 56th percentile in the 40 yard dash, but his speed score, which adjusts his 40 yard dash for his size and compares it with other people about his size, he ranked in the 90th percentile in that. He also ranked in the 78th percentile for his burst score, and he has an 81st percentile catch radius. Not to mention, he also had a 95th percentile breakout age, which is absolutely key for watching out for breakout players and players who are going to be successful in the NFL. Breakout age is very important. His college target share was also in the 81st percentile, and his college dominator rating was in the 89th percentile, and both of those are also very important as well. Nikhil Harry has a good size for an NFL wide receiver. At 6'2", 228, most cornerbacks are going to be struggling keeping up with him in terms of physicality. He's big, and he can push his cornerbacks around. Also, I just love Nikhil Harry as a prospect as a whole. After watching his college film at Arizona State, after watching the few snaps that he played last season as a Patriot, I do really like him, especially in the future for him. Also, he's on the New England Patriots. Whenever you're on the New England Patriots, chances are you're a pretty good player. The New England Patriots know how to identify very good players. Nikhil Harry had seven targets in each of his last two games, including the playoffs. He only played eight total games, so it's only fair, considering he was a rookie, to look towards the very end of his season. He only played eight games, and he was a rookie, so I do feel like it's fair to just look at the last two games and realize that, okay, they used him a lot then. That is pretty promising. Not to mention they used him in the playoffs, which is the most important time of the year for these NFL teams. Including the playoffs, he played in over 50% of the offensive snaps in each of his last four games. They were starting to use him more often on a consistent basis as they saw him putting up some solid production for how much they were playing him in the first half of his season. Nikhil Harry has the ability to line up pretty much anywhere on the field. He can be a slot receiver, but... Sometimes it is a little tough just because the route running is very important and which, will, which I will get to later, he's not the best route runner. As you can see here, he only played in the slot 10.6% of the time, so he didn't always line up as a slot receiver mainly because that's probably the worst spot for him to line up as, but he is still acceptable as a slot receiver. He can line up anywhere and that's very important for a team, especially the Patriots, to use him on a consistent basis. He's very good in most categories, such as yards after catch. He also has great hands and is extremely good with contested catches. Watching his college film, you can really see how great he was at eyeing a ball in the air, especially over the back shoulder and coming down with it. Now, it may seem like he's not great in yards after catch, considering he doesn't have great acceleration, he's not super, super shifty, right? You can see his agility score was in the 38th percentile. But what you have to remember is he's big. At 228, he's going to be bigger than most of the cornerbacks and safeties. So in a way, he's like a bulldozer. He doesn't necessarily truck people, but anyone who tries to tackle him, it's going to be hard. It takes multiple people to bring him down. So he gets yards after catch just running in a straight line and waiting for people to collectively try to bring him down, which can be a struggle for those defenses because of his size. 
Nikhil Harry is great with screens. He loves to catch screens. That's something that he absolutely thrives with. And the Patriots, as we know, love throwing screen passes. Not only because Tom Brady likes throwing short balls, but because Bill Belichick just is a fan of short, consistent passes. Now, his limited route tree includes many shorter routes that may seem like it's a bad thing, but the Patriots love to throw those kind of routes, those really, really short routes. The Patriots love utilizing because they're safer routes. It minimizes the risk of throwing an interception. They love those kinds of players. Look at Julian Edelman. He's not a complete deep threat, but they use him a lot because he's such a safe player and he runs shorter routes. And Nikhil Harry is very good at those short routes as well. Jarrett Stidham is a fantastic fit for Nikhil Harry. We don't know how he's going to be, but just looking at how he was in college and what his play style was, we can confirm that he is a very good fit for Nikhil Harry. Jarrett Stidham is a very good decision maker, posting an 18 to 5 touchdown to interception ratio in his junior year at Auburn. Not to mention he was in a tough SEC conference, so that 18 to 5 touchdown to interception ratio is more impressive than in any other conference. He also threw for 12 touchdowns with just two interceptions in his rookie season at Baylor. He is a good decision maker and in a way resembles Tom Brady's play style, which is probably why the Patriots decided to draft him. With a mere 7.6 yards per attempt in his junior year at Auburn, he was tied for 54th in yards per attempt amongst all D1 quarterbacks that season. Once again, that is something that kind of relates to Tom Brady, throwing shorter passes. Just as Nikhil Harry thrives with back shoulder type passes, Stidham loves to throw them and is actually very good at it. So not only does Stidham like to throw short passes, which Nikhil Harry likes to catch, but he also likes to throw back shoulder passes, which Nikhil Harry also likes to catch and is very good at them. There's also a lack of competition in the red zone. Yes, this team is going to be a fairly good team, but they're mainly going to be carried by their defense, just like they were last year. And while there are some solid running backs on this team, when it comes to receivers and tight ends, there's not that many players, especially in the red zone. There's not many bigger guys like Nikhil Harry on this team who are very big red zone threats. If this team is in the red zone a lot, which they could be considering how good their defense is, Nikhil Harry should be getting a lot of red zone targets. The Patriots clearly liked him. They used the 32nd overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft on him, and there's basically this idea that if the Patriots use a high draft pick on you, you're good, right? The Patriots have a great scouting team, and they know what they're doing, and considering the Patriots use such a high draft pick on Nikhil Harry, it shows that they're going to use him and that he's a very good player. However, there certainly are a lot of concerns about him going into this season. We barely saw Nikhil Harry play last season. We are completely unsure of how good he actually is at the NFL level. Many of these other sophomore wide receivers we saw play a full 16 or almost 16 game season, and we saw whether or not they were good or if they were pretty bad and seems like they might not have a bright future. We didn't quite get to see that out of Nikhil Harry. We only saw him play about half a season, and he was injured throughout that season, so it is kind of hard to tell how good he was. There's also some uncertainty in this offense. We don't know, A, how good it'll be, and two, how it'll operate, considering that Tom Brady is not the quarterback anymore. Yes, Jarrett Stidham is a very good fit for Nikhil Harry, at least looking at how they both played at college, but who knows, things could change because things change in the NFL. James White and Julian Edelman are still the undoubted top targets in this offense. They will definitely be taking a lot of the targets, and in James White's case, some runs as well. And these will be opportunities that are being taken away from the Keel Harry. Julian Edelman is proven and a very safe player. The Patriots absolutely love him. They're going to be treating him as the wide receiver one and Nikhil Harry as the wide receiver two at the best. That is a little concerning. 
Nikhil Harry is a pretty bad route runner. That's the one thing that he really struggled with at college and, and in his minimal games in the NFL last season. Route running is very important, especially in the red zone. It is something that could hinder his production. He also had a horrendous 14.3% contested catch rate last season. I know I said contested catches were something that he does very well with because he did at college, but like I said earlier, contested catches are something that receivers struggle with in the NFL, even if they were good at it in college. So considering that Nikhil Harry didn't even play a full rookie season, he might come out struggling in this category as well. Now, I do expect him to get better at it as the season goes on, but how long is it going to take for him to put up solid production in contested catches when they come his way? Because they certainly want to use him with contested catches and just throwing him 50-50 balls and expecting him to come down with it. With a new unproven quarterback and with Zoe Michelle, James White, Rex Burkhead, and Damian Harris, who are all either proven backs or backs with high potential, in Damian Harris's case. With all those players, the Patriots are likely to make the running game a huge priority when they have a lead. Sure, Julian Edelman is very good, and Nikhil Harry is very talented as well, but all of those running backs form one of the best running back committees in the entire NFL. When they are up, which should be happening a lot, they are most certainly going to want to establish the run game and keep defenses on their toes by using a variety of running backs because we all know the Patriots love to use every single one of their running backs each week. Last but certainly not least, Nikhil Harry suffered an ankle sprain in the 2019 preseason. This caused him to miss a total of nine games, right? That's over half of the regular NFL season. We don't know how that will affect him this season. It might not affect him, but for all we know, he could re-injure that ankle. We never know until it happens or it doesn't happen. He also suffered a toe sprain in the preseason and he suffered a hip contusion in week 14, although that did not cause him to miss any time. But nonetheless, all of these injuries still are worth noting because with three notable injuries, they could either be re-injured this season or they could hinder his performance. So with all of this being said, what do I think about Nikhil Harry? As the wide receiver 61 and a mid-14th round pick per fantasydata.com PPR ADP once again, he is going pretty late. And as a mid-14th round pick, that means that he's really going anywhere between the 12th round to undrafted because in the late rounds, people aren't afraid to reach one, two, or even three rounds ahead. And a lot of these players just completely go undrafted because they're only two rounds away from it or maybe even one round away, in Nikhil Harry's case, if your draft is 15 rounds instead of 16 rounds. So he might go in the 12th round, or he might end up on free age on the waiver wire. But nonetheless, he is a later round pick if he's being drafted, and I think he's great. Now, if you need someone, just a depth piece, someone who you know is going to get you points, Larry Fitzgerald or Hunter Renfro are probably better players. Like I talked about in last video, which if you haven't seen, now you might as well finish this video because there's only a few minutes left, but after it finishes, I do recommend you watching the two previous videos, part one and part two of this series. And if you already watched that, you'd know that I mentioned this about Hunter Renfro. He's someone who is just a depth piece. If you have two or three very good wide receivers who you can count on, but that's all you have, and you don't have any more depth, and you just need someone to fill in for buys, Hunter Renfro is a good player for that. Larry Fitzgerald can also do this as well. Nikhil Harry isn't one of those guys because he could bust or he could be very good. But if you are kind of uncertain with your receivers and you're not sure how good they are going to be, Nikhil Harry is a very good guy for this. Now, there are some other decent options in this round range, like the 13th to 16th round. But I do think Nikhil Harry is probably one of the best ones there. So I think he's definitely worth taking. And I'm not afraid to take him in pretty much every league. But the thing is, even though I do think that he has a lot of potential, there might be a reason to just not draft him if he's there in the 16th round. Because if he's on free agency, then you can basically just watch week one and see how they use him. Because even if he goes off for 7 for 110 and a touchdown, 
there's a good chance people aren't even going to be putting in waiver claims for him because he's a second wide receiver on a team that might not be that great in terms of offense. Now, I do think that he's worth drafting, but if you don't, keep an eye out for him absolutely producing starting week one because if he does and if they use him on a large majority of their snaps, I do think he has a bright future this season. So redraft, regular redraft, regular fantasy football where you just start players at the beginning of the day on Sunday and they're locked in or Thursday or Monday depending on when they play. In those regular leagues, I love Nikhil Harry and same thing with best ball because he is a pretty high potential player on a weekly basis even if he's not great on the season as a whole. So I definitely love him in both of those formats. And in Dynasty, I like him even more because he's so talented. I absolutely love him. I think at some point he will be a wide receiver one at some point in his career. I don't know if it'll be now. I mean, it probably won't be now because if it was, then I'd be telling him to go draft him whenever you possibly can. And even though I think that might not be a bad strategy, I'm not saying that you absolutely have to do that. But in the future, when he gets in a better situation with a more reliable team and a team that we know is going to have a good offense, he's going to be phenomenal. So in Dynasty, I'm seeing his price slipping a lot of times, and I absolutely want to buy that any day of the week, whether you're trading for him or drafting him in a Dynasty startup. Go after him for sure. I'm bigger on him in Dynasty than in Best Ball or Regular Redraft, but even in Best Ball and Regular Redraft, I love him. Go take him in all those leagues, please. I love him, and if he's not playing a lot of the snaps, and if this offense doesn't look great, it's fine. You can always drop him, right? It's not a high pick, so you're not investing a lot into him. Well, guys, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I do recommend following me on Twitter because I put out a lot more content over there than here, so it's definitely worth your time to just go in the description, click that link, and give me a follow, and you'll be getting a lot of good content every single day in your Twitter feed. So that will wrap it up, guys. Thank you so much for watching. In the comments below, if you have any videos that you really want to see or any cool video ideas, please let me know what you want me to cover. Maybe sophomore running backs, maybe sophomore quarterbacks, maybe individual players that you really want to hear my analysis on. Please let me know. And... That'll all be it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. I'm a newer YouTuber, and all that stuff really helps. Share this video if you know someone who would find this useful. And thank you, guys. I will see you later. Peace.